All right, hello everyone. So today I want to talk about what is, in my humble opinion, a book series which every player who is looking to improve their chess game should read at some point. And it is going to be none other than the Yusupov books. I have one of them myself. And so basically to understand what actually makes these books so special, I think it's worth also explaining the origin of how they came about. And first of all, it was once again written by this Russian super GM, Art Yusupov. Now he's a bit older, he doesn't play as much, but in his prime he was at one point number 3 in the world. And also I should mention a world class trainer, not just for like super GMs, but also for amateur players. And he basically recognised that there was sort of a lack, especially at the time when he was writing these books, of good material for players looking for like a systematic way to work on their chess and improve. Because there's a lot of books, right, that are like on certain topics, and it's like, they can be accessible to some extent from players, say like 1600 all the way up to the master level, but of course the problem with such books, and there's a lot of them, is that because they're accessible for such a large range of players, naturally there's going to be one group of players that gets more out of the books than another. But the good thing about the use of books is not only is there a lot of good material within them, but they're designed in such a way such that the player bracket that that book is specifically aimed at is going to get a lot out of it, which will of course like quote unquote optimize improvement. But also it's worth explaining the general structure of each of these books. So basically each book will have 24 chapters. And basically for each of these chapters in the book, user Publix is going to give a couple annotated games to show some illustrative ideas, followed by 12 exercises which you have to solve. And the thing I really like about these exercises, it's not just like, you know, here's an exercise, okay now it's a solution, okay you found it or not. He really does a good job at implementing this grading system where it's like, okay, if you didn't find the full line, it's not like you completely got the exercise wrong. You might have found the first move, that's two points. This exercise is worth four points, you got two out of four. But if you found the whole solution, you get four points. And this is good for sort of being accountable for your solution. He also explains early on the book that he suggests you actually properly write down your solutions so that you're not like bullshitting yourself when you actually check the answers and that you fully know well what you actually saw and what you didn't, compared to just, you know, not writing down the answers and then sort of seeing the solution and being like, oh yeah, I think I saw that when in reality, like, no you didn't. And then basically at the end of each chapter, there's going to be like a tally, there's going to be like an excellent mark, a good mark, and a pass mark. If you don't hit the pass mark, what he suggests basically is you repeat the chapter, probably not right after, he doesn't state this explicitly, but I assume you probably wouldn't repeat it right after you just failed it, because then you would probably have the solutions fresh in your head, so maybe like a month or two later you would go back for it again. I personally only ever failed one chapter in the book just because once again I was a little bit above the level of the book uh, that it was supposed to be catering towards. But in general I do sort of like the idea of this whole grading system because you know it's also good for sort of being able to pick out what things are you good at, what things are you not so good at, your strengths and weaknesses so to speak. Like if you're acing all the calculation stuff or you're failing all the calculation stuff then it's a lot easier to look at that and be like well Maybe after I finish this Yusupov book, maybe it's worth doing or not doing further work on this particular aspect of my game. But also on the topic of there being a variety of subjects covered in the Yusupov books, I thought it was worth saying that I actually really think this is a good thing. A lot of people, you know, they like having a singular book on like this one subject going really in depth into it. But the reality is for most players is that we don't just have one weakness or one thing we need to work on, we need to holistically improve our whole game and that's what Yusupov these books really deliver on really well in my opinion. And on a final note before I show at least some of the positions I liked and also some of the opening sections in the book, the least the one I own, I thought it was worth mentioning that a lot of the examples and stuff covered in these Yusupov books, a lot of the times these positions aren't, you know, like super flashy, you know, like, wow, that's an amazing move. It's a lot of times just very simple, almost you could say dry. I don't think that really gives justice to how, you know, instructive these books are, calling it dry. But that's sometimes how it might feel when you work through these books. But I don't necessarily view that as a bad thing because a lot of the times, you know, when you play chess, it's not these exciting, like, you know, like crazy flashy moves. And a lot of the times it's, you know, you have to do the quote unquote boring stuff well in order to play the game well as well. 
I didn't mean to say well so many times, but there we go. And before I show one example exercise from one of the Yusupov books that I quite liked, I want to briefly talk about the opening sections of the books, which a lot of people will tell you to skip over because they're like, well, they're only like 10 pages short. They're basically because each chapter in the Yusupov books is basically of an equivalent length. You can't really dedicate that much detail to these, you know, opening variations and whatnot. And this is both a good and a bad thing, especially at lower levels, you don't really need a lot of detail for opening stuff. So you get a very concise version of like what Yusupov gives you that could be seen as a good thing in some sense. But there's also the thing of like the opening variations he shows you, like for example against E4, he shows the French defense. And if you don't like the French, well obviously, you know, you're probably not going to play even if he shows this to you. But even so, I would still recommend, in spite of what other people would say, just skip these sections. I still actually recommend going over them. And the reason is, is that I think it's important to learn different pawn structures even in openings you don't play because there's always a possibility one day you might switch that opening, who knows, or just like via a different opening in like some opening in your repertoire, you might somehow get this structure anyway, in which case it would, you know, just be beneficial to your overall chess education, so to speak, if you were sort of more aware of the general plans and ideas that can arise from these positions. And also against d4, Black, he recommended the Queen's Gambit accepted. And he also did give a brief white repertoire with 1d4, covering some of the main defenses, not everything since that would be kind of impossible to do. Um, there were like a couple different chapters dedicated to like some of the main defenses, not necessarily like, for example, this and this in one chapter, that would sort of be impossible. Like for example, with the King's Indian, he showed the dismissal of defense, so dismissal of variation rather. And against the e6 variations, he also showed not c4 here, but rather e3, which definitely limits the amount of theory you need to know. And that's the thing about these opening sections in the use of books. If you do use them, you're not going to need to know massive amounts of theory. He shows you a lot of important ideas, he shows you the basic theory, and that's usually going to be enough to get you going. Uh, in particular, he doesn't recommend systems with C3, I think that's a little more pure Kongi, he recommends a Kongi Zuka tort system, going B3, and uh, these, despite looking relatively innocuous, do uh, definitely pack a bit of venom, as I have experienced when I was a bit younger, I struggled a lot playing against these systems, actually. But uh, yeah, that's just an example of some of the openings that were recommended in the book that I have, in my own use of one, I only own one of the whole series, just because, you know, by the time I already did one of them, I was already like 2100, so going through the rest of them, especially since I found that one to be not the most difficult in the world, I felt that, you know, they're probably better use of my time at that point. But uh, yeah, nonetheless, that's my take on these whole, like, opening stuff. You know, at the end of the day, it's your choice whether you want to do it or not, but I, I recommend, you know, going over these chapters and just sort of absorbing everything you can. And so to finish off, this is an example exercise from the book, which I quite liked. It's also, once again, feeding the bill of not being a super flashy position, really. It was under the chapter of, and by the way, if you want to pause the video at any point and try and figure out what you would play as black, by all means. But essentially, this position was under the chapter of simple tactics, which to a lot of people, you know, simple tactics might sound like, you know, some forks or pins or skewers or something like that. But Yusupov has a bit of a different idea of what it means for simple tactics. And basically what I got from Yusupov was that when he meant simple tactics, he was more referring to the idea that often, you know, you have a lot of these sort of mini tactics, I guess you could call them, in various positions where it's like, say you want to accomplish a certain strategic objective, you're going to try and employ not like a full-on tactic, but a sort of like mini tactical idea to sort of get what you want. And in this position, black is a bit passive. They are really sort of struggling almost. And if white's able to just like develop their bishop out, bring their rooks to the center, they sort of just have a space advantage and black really sort of struggles. Their pawn structure is also worse. It's not very easy to play the black position. Maybe also like a kingside pawn storm could be coming. That's also something to keep in mind. So what the black player in this game came up with and the solution of this puzzle was to play knight d5. And a lot of people, you know, knight d5 isn't the most difficult move in the world to see. A lot of people could see this. But the thing that I liked about this puzzle was that knight d5, it's not like this move reads like a forced win or anything. It, it doesn't at all. But yet again, this is not unlike a lot of positions you'll have in games. You'll have a lot of small opportunities like these to play a move like knight d5 to sort of try and free your position. One of the ideas as well, of course, if possible, we'd just like to win the dark sword bishop. 
this sort of trade would of course not be good for white so it follows it also if white plays something like bishop f2 we'll play bishop f4 check 93 and now we have the bishop pair and also excellent control of the dark squares black is just better now so that kind of leaves two other moves in this position bishop takes a7 and also bishop d2 bishop takes a7 was played in the game but is incredibly risky especially after rook a8 what happened in the game was ed5 but now white was up a pawn but black had the bishop pair once again very nice control over the dark squares and uh, also this knight in a4, which is very kind of vulnerable, as, as the famous saying goes. Knights on the rim are dim, and uh, the play of the black pieces, I forget who was actually playing. But nonetheless, they were able to very quickly exploit this fact, and eventually just trap the knight on a4. It can't be protected with b3, because rook takes a4 wins it anyway. And so they were able to win the game like that. But the other small variation was now bishop d2. This is simply knight b6. And it might sort of be like, so what? But the point is that now after knight takes b6, rook takes b6, black just simply has pretty decent piece activity. Uh, sort of not so subtle threat in this position is actually bishop a3, if white say plays a move like bishop d3, simply attacking the pawn. This is a big threat, and if they take, well, they're going to get made in the next move. And if instead bishop c4 with the idea now to meet bishop a3 with bishop b3, well then we can play bishop a6, and if say an exchange like this, we have some very active files for our rooks to sort of pounce on still bishop a3 ideas in the air and yeah black is objectively equal and probably i would even argue has the slightly better chances and again nothing in this example really seems super special it just seems like a bunch of sort of ordinary moves but sometimes and a lot of the time really it's these small kind of simple things that you really need to do well to play chess well. Chess, a lot of the time, is not about finding these, you know, crazy, you know, amazing double X lamb, you know, combinations, which you had to calculate 20 moves deep to see. A lot of the time, it's just like, you know, calculate a couple of variations, three to four moves deep, see the key ideas, and that's pretty much what this puzzle was. But anyways, that's it for the video. As usual, please like, subscribe if you're not already. Check out my free newsletter in the description below for weekly-ish articles on chess improvement related topics. And now uh, if you're interested in coaching, I have a form down below that you can fill out. But with that being said, that's it for this video. See you guys until next time.